Can you believe it? According to reports, episode 1 of season 2 got 50% fewer views than season 1's first episode. I wonder how big the drop-off for this season's numbers of viewers is gonna be. Anyway, let's get into it. Rings of Power Season 2, Episode 2 begins in the bowels of Mount Doom. The ignition of the volcano damaged Tolkien's world so that its influence spreads like Zerg creep across Middle-earth. In Casa Doom, Durin the Dim and his wife Disa the Diva are shopping when Disa realizes something's wrong and whispers to everyone to take cover instead of yelling it out so everyone could hear her. Galadriel must be blowing those seven horns of Jericho I mentioned because Casa Doom begins to collapse. Or it's because Disa's walking around. Durin then tackles her to the ground instead of picking her up and taking shelter. The collapse blocks the tunnels used to bring light into the mountain, and the inhabitants of Casa Doom now know what it's like to go through rolling blackouts in Los Angeles. Later, Durin the Fourth holds a council to decide what to do, and one of his advisors, Narvi, says, Hey, listen, the tunnels are blocked, so we're digging new ones. Why? Just unbury what collapsed. Oh, but Disa says they aren't safe. Sure, but she says the new tunnels aren't either, so just focus on what you can clear out with less effort. So anyway, these dingbats decide to sing into the tunnels to find new paths. Except even Casa Doom itself can't stand Lizzo's singing voice, and it collapses even more. Great job. Should have just let the miners do their jobs before opening your mouth. Anyway, Durin then asks Disa about Durin after the two had a fight, which devolves into Disa blaming the king for the disconnection with the mountain because of his quarrel with his son. And she keeps her head, of course, because unlike Galadriel, Disa hasn't been reined in. Meanwhile, in one of the tunnels, Durin the Dim helps dig, and one of the background dwarves says, Another dead end. What? It's a mountain, there are no dead ends. Unless you're up against obsidian with an iron pick, I don't believe you. Also, how were the dwarves struggling to dig when Durin the Dim was shown to destroy rocks in the previous season like a fat kid eating Oreos? Even Elrond the Foreheaded was splitting rock more effectively than these idiots. Oh, how could I forget? The writers don't care about their own continuity. Anyway, Durin's getting blisters because apparently the rock smashing challenge means nothing, and some of the diggers bully Durin and blame him and his father. For what? The dwarves know the volcanic eruption in the south is what caused the collapse. How are these two to blame? I'll talk about the forced drama later, so let's just move on. Back at home, Dimwit and Lizzo vent their frustrations about the situation when an invitation arrives, summoning them to Eregion. Jumping over to Rune, we catch up with the third party of Acolytes from the previous season in service to Great Value Saruman. And guess who's back? Back again. So Walmart here scolds Feminem for her failings before one of his masked trackers arrives informing them he found the Ishtar. Feminem's like, be careful, he's really strong in the ways of the Force. Then the tracker says, nah fam, I got a plan to make him do what I want. I'm gonna threaten the halflings. I'm sorry, what? Slim Shady here already tried this and failed, and it resulted in her and the other two acolytes being sent to the graveyard before the Eternal Witness over here brought them back. Also, why aren't you speaking up and explaining this? Whatever, totally not Saruman here says, make it so, and the tracker leaves. Meanwhile, Gandalf and the two extra sacks of weight wander into Rune, seeking a destination that no one has explained yet. Then standing yet again on a high point able to overlook the valley below, Poppy suggests cutting the trip in half by walking in a straight fucking line. Then, against all wisdom, Nori, the other nomadic Harfoot, who knows how valuable an easy shortcut is when traveling, especially when they are critically low on food and water, says no. And Gandalf agrees. Their reasoning? The shortcut is a straight line that would drain them of their resources. I officially endorse Great Value and his followers in their attempts to kill you. So the gaggle of retards decide to wander in circles again and eventually are caught up by the trackers. This is a scene straight out of Looney Tunes. The Harfoots hide under their woven burlap sack between two rocks, while Gandalf basically hides behind a tree. And this works! Are you from Jurassic Park? How does woven netting resemble smooth faced rock. The shot is so bad they even zoomed in to obscure the hiding place. So anyway, these idiots get away and continue to waste fewer resources and energy by having not Gandalf drag them around. Eventually, they happen upon a well with a bell wrapped around it, and after Gandalf collapses, the two sound the alarm, getting the hobo some water. Then the trackers attack with the most brilliant strategy ever, presenting themselves from a distance 
and charging from a single direction. Yeah, so much for threatening the Harfoots. The trackers charge forward and not Gandalf shows them his favorite movie as Twister by summoning a tornado that blows away the trackers and the halflings. Hey, why, why even attempt to worry us when these characters can survive catastrophic events point blank? I mean, the T-1000 takes more damage than these characters, for God's sake. We return to Galadriel, having a nightmare in Eregion, in which Celebrimbor reveals Stranger Things is his favorite show before getting pinned to the tree with a red filter, and for some reason, the elven verse of the ring is quoted in the background. Where the hell did that come from? The One Ring doesn't exist yet, nor the rings of men and dwarves. Everything's reversed like Payne and McKay read the appendices upside down. So Galadriel apparently snaps out of it because she was having a daydream in front of Gilgalad. Why not mention this? Not a clue. A vision as foreboding as what you witnessed with the Palantir on Numenor, and you keep that to yourself? You eat soup with a fork, don't you? Anyway, King Double Chin asks Galadriel what she thinks of the plan she's totally aware of. She offers advice, the council convenes, and Gilgalad pulls her aside to ask her what's on her mind, and she AGAIN does not tell him what she saw. But she does suggest what she believes Sauron's plan is, that being to conquer Middle-earth, not by force, but by compulsion, using the rings. The very rings they are wearing. So take them off. No one does, of course, and Turkey Neck mentions that Celebrimbor and his craft is safe from Sauron, since Eregion is protected. Were you blackout drunk last episode? You know Halbrand is Sauron, and since he influenced the creation of the rings, he knows much, if not the whole process, to make them, and he can take different forms. How is Celebrimbor guaranteed to be safe? I can't tell if the room is cold or if that's his IQ. So dumbass in chief here suggests Galadriel is possibly influenced by Sauron just before she has a quick flash of him in Eregion. And again, she does not mention anything, making me wonder if the writer's favorite movie is Dracula because I'm getting the same psychic connection thing going on here. And apparently Gilgalad is experiencing the same things and tells Galadriel that Sauron, once inside your mind, can possibly shape it and and this has all been happening because of the rings. TAKE THE FUCKING RINGS OFF! Now, because this episode isn't done testing my patience like Jesus ran a daycare for demons, we jump over to the Grey Havens, where Galadriel wants to talk with Elrond. He's working on one of the ship's pieces, putting as much effort into sanding it as a eunuch does masturbating. Galadriel requests Elrond help her, and he straight up says no. Amazing! You're no longer Elrond the Foreheaded. Now? You're just Elrond. So Galadriel leaves to change her pad while Elrond goes to speak with Círdan, seeking advice. The real Dirty Dan agrees Elrond's fear of the ring's power is justified, but then mentions their power to control other life forms, which he demonstrates on some fish, will absolutely be used for good because the people who have them are trustworthy. D did you miss the fact that Sauron influenced the rings? Refusing to remove them is why Elrond doesn't trust even Gilgalad entirely. And then Kir Dandadan here tells Elrond he needs to learn humility and help his friends. I'm sorry, did they reshoot this entire scene? Humility should be Galadriel's lesson, not Elrond's. Elrond is completely correct here. The rings should be removed to prevent any aid to Sauron. For that matter, Elrond doesn't even know if this is Círdan saying this or Sauron. And then Elrond accepts this! Way to go, Elrond half-tarded. That promotion was lost faster than finding a new secretary under the desk. Then back in the capital, Galadriel enters Gilgalad's chambers, where he agrees to send Galadriel with Eltard, but only if he's in charge. Lastly, we finally jump over to Eregion and catch up with Kelly Brimbor requesting Halbrand leave the city. Of course, Halbrand refuses and isn't immediately removed by the guards. Good job, guys. Celebrimbor mentions to his assistant it's no big deal as a messenger from Linden should arrive any day now before cutting over to said messenger, and it turns out that he and his companions have been cut down. Who, when, and how the fuck did anyone learn about the messenger heading to Eregion? Anyway, later that night, Celebrimbor welcomes Abercrombie and Bitch into his chamber because he has the lowest speech requirement ever. So Sauron turns into a yes man because Celebrimbor actually says he finally created something of importance. 
yeah, thousands of years as the greatest Elvin Smith since Fanor, and only now have you created something worth a shit. Not like you led the construction of Eregion itself, but okay. Anyway, Halbrand explains he's here to request additional rings for men and dwarves, revealing that he isn't who he says he is. Then with lightning flashing, thunder crashing, rain pouring, and Halbrand vanishing, Celebrimbor thinks this is just fine. And then his hearth bursts a light, and from the flame emerges... Anatar. Or Anatar, because these idiots pronounce the second N. Alright, so we have a lot to go over, starting with the stock market crash of intelligence. I suppose it's keeping with tradition these characters season the lead ingots they eat with microplastics. The elves should be on high alert sending scouts to every corner of Middle-earth in hopes of hearing even a whisper of Sauron's presence and intentions. He's the Dark Lord, second in command to Morgoth, sorcerer, shapeshifter, and master manipulator. The greatest threat to Middle-earth since the IRS, and these idiots are just like, yeah, sure, let's use the rings he helped make. I'm still gonna reserve judgment on Galadriel's direction this season, because I'm sure the writers will eventually return her to who she was, seeing as she's still as prideful as Vegeta. She admits she was wrong and manipulated, but still wants to make the same mistake of approaching problems head-on, applied directly to the forehead. But High King Jello, I'm about to give up on, because this two-pump chump's firm action has already gone limp. Sure, he orders action throughout the realm for the safety of his people, but he refuses to remove and secure the rings. Did the War of Wrath not solidify how dangerous anything associated with Sauron can be? And how about Celebrimbor? He's the first person to distrust Anatar, but here he's so insecure that at the mere mention of Narya, Nenya, and Vilya, he grabs some boba tea, sits down, crosses his legs, and asks Halbrand to spill. Which, by the way, the power of the rings was never mentioned, so not only should the characters not know what they do, neither should we, unless, like I, you know the books. So the these characters know things they shouldn't, like those mystery movies written by Ryan Johnson. Then there's the wise cure to do to do Bro's powered by a potato to have the takes he does. He manipulates a group of fish to show the potential of the three rings to control the will of others, and thinks no one could be manipulated by Sauron into using these rings for evil. You're older than Feanor himself, know the kinslaying of the Alqualande, and for some reason believe the same influence more Morgoth had over Feanor will not drive you and your allies to a similar fate? Well, that's just as retarded as the forced drama between these characters. I get writers today want to reflect the world we live in by forcing drama between people with all the delight of warring high school factions, but this is part of what I mentioned before about Galadriel's inconsistency. She defied Gilgalad, abandoned Return to Valinor, challenged Queen Muriel, led an expeditionary force to Middle-earth, defeated the orcs, and saved the people of the Southlands all in service of stopping Sauron, without any use of dark magic, and of course the knowledge Halbrand was Sauron the whole time. But now she knows Sauron's back, and the best of these writers could think that she could do was force division amongst everyone? Elrond doesn't trust Galadriel because of the manipulation she was under. He doesn't quite trust Gilgalad for the same reason, so he jumped off the cliff to get away from them. Then there's the dwarven drama, which makes even less sense since they are angry with each other over things out of their control. The quarrel between Durin and his sequel was stupid from the get-go since it would improve the relations with elves. The people of Khazad-dûm blaming both Durins for the collapse of the tunnels has literally zero reason to occur as the council reported it understands that the volcano in the south was the cause of the cave-in. It's weird to me the writers fear that people can work together in trying times to stop evil or just work through a situation. Also, I didn't mention this last video because I was hoping it was more of a fluke of the previous episode, but it's pretty consistent between episodes 2 and 3. Even the color grading is really bad. The brightest lit outdoor locations, such as the Grey Havens or the Badlands of Ruin, aren't too bad, though that ever-so-subtle bloom effect from the movies is gone. But when inside or undercover of any kind, for some reason, it's like everyone who went to lighting school skipped out on those days of filming. This is inside Celebrimbor 
Wars Forge. This was Rivendell 23 years ago. This is Casa Doom before the tunnels collapse. This is Balin's tomb inside Moria. This is a Region from atop Celebrimbor's tower. And this is the stormy night of the Battle of Helm's Deep. I'm amazed by just how bad this show continues to get, worsening over time, and with more and more details mishandled. One billion dollars, everyone. As I mentioned before, I wonder just how low the viewership percentages will get by the end of the season. Only 37% finished the series the first time around, but what do you think? Will it go up or down? And if so, what do you think the percentage will be? Let's have fun with some predictions in the comments below while I continue to watch this shit for you guys. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.